Hi, Janine. Do you have our voice? Hello? Do you have our voice, Janine? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Amazing. Okay. So, Perfect. So we are recording the screen, right? Uh, we are recording the camera. Okay. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, this is the maximum. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so this blackboard is going to be the point of attention here. Good afternoon or good day in future. Um, we're going to talk about algorithms for finding level sets, right? So we decided to postpone the workshop, but give you a good old fashioned lecture about level sets and level set algorithms. So what is the level set? So imagine you have a discretized space. So in the uh, entire course, we have been talking about graphs for discretizing uh, graphs that are dual to a raster space. But for the sake of the argumentation, let me this time use another kind of a graph. These are ourselves. And these are the points on which we have done some measurement of, let's say, temperature. Right? Temperature in this room, in this very room. Yeah, how many thermometers do we afford to have? Let's say, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? Do we expect all the thermometers to show exactly the same temperature or not? Probably not, right? So they can show different temperatures. So let's say, what's the temperature? What's your guess around 19 something? Maybe. Assuming that they're all correct, by the way. So if I wanted to find a threshold between uh, temperatures above 19 degrees and below, is, is that even a valid question? Does, does, does there exist a threshold between temperatures below and above 19 degrees in this room if we have these measurements sampled? We assume that, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you are going in an in interesting direction. So even though our measurements are discrete, in, in this case, we kind of assume that there is a continuous space in which there exists also values in between, right? And if there's any value between, I don't know, 18.7 and 19.6, then yeah, somewhere in between the two, there can exist a value which is exactly 19. We don't have it in our samples, nevertheless, it can exist, right? You remember from, from the point about interpolation, right? So we had these data points, the funny data points about the grade point averages of, of students and the first salary they gain after graduation, right? So this is what our mind is trained to do, right? We interpolate. So you just see a bunch of points, but I find it appealing to draw a curve because that's easy to remember. The message being, even if you linearly model it, the, the lower the grade point average, the higher the first salary, et cetera. Whether that's true or not, that's another discussion, right? But this is the appeal of interpolation. You, you don't see the entire picture. You, what you have is just a bunch of data points, right? So we have a few people which we have recorded uh, for, which, for whom we have recorded their first salaries after graduation, et cetera, et cetera. So effectively, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But you can't help but notice that there is a pattern, right? You're always looking for these patterns in data, right? But nevertheless, back to this point. In this case, we, we talked about the insufficiency of the linear models for interpolation, right? 
because sometimes our data does not look like a linear Euclidean space and our data may look like a manifold space, right? But then exactly at that point, we talked about something else, which was that maybe finding one single line for, for describing the whole data set, uh, no matter how appealing that is to a human, because these kind of linear rules are easy to remember, the less of this, the more of that, the more of this, the more of that, etc. It does not do justice to describing the pattern that we see here, right? Because it may be actually a little bit like this, right? Uh, or with the other data points. If we aim to fit a line, we can always fit a line, you know, even if, we, if our data set looks like this, which is the worst case scenario. If you aim to fit a line, it will fit a line, right? Whether that line actually describes your data set or not, that's another question which, which can be addressed by looking at the residuals, which is the sum of the squared errors from this representation to the closest point on this representation, right? So whenever you, you look at some regression model that, or some model that is fit, uh, fitted to your data and is supposed to represent your data, then that the immediate question should be, can I look at the residual? How perfectly does it describe? the pattern or the trend in our data set, right? But exactly at that point, we talked about the idea of interpolation, linear interpolation between these points being reasonable, remember? Right? So in, in absence of other information, in absence of other information, isn't, if this is all we have, this is the discretization that we have, these are the measurements that we have, is it not reasonable to assume that there can exist a linear interpolation between these two or any interpolation for that matter, not necessarily linear, right? We can assume that there's continuity in the way temperature, um, let's say, exists, because it's an indicator of the, the, the velocity or the movement of the particles in, in, in an item. It's not a measure of heat, it's a measure of how much they're dancing, right? How rapidly they're dancing, right? So do us with this picture, there's this other picture. Oh no, this line didn't exist. And so along this line, there should be a point that has a temperature being exactly 19, right? So if, if you want to find, uh, The, the, the level set, we can find it, right? Between these two, there should also be another one. And between you over here, these two, there should be another point. And between these two, there, there exists none, and so on and so forth, right? So can, can we, can we make a border between all the, all the areas that uh, above and below 19. What is the first border that we can make? Let's let's think about. Can I maybe pass you a chart to draw the one? Well, I'll just start from the top corner and then once the dot starts, the box is made. This one. Yeah, I better just show you the next closest dot that you do on this. So the, um, the point domain. Ah. Okay, can, can we simplify this point as the point along here? Okay. Yeah. 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 So at that point in time, it goes back up to the line. Maybe I created a difficult example, right? Difficult. What is yours? So if you want to simplify this border, oh, okay, this point is isolated actually. You know, very simple one. So this will be a border, very simple one, yeah. right? And there existed two more. So this one and this one yeah. are also separate. Does that do, do the job, right? This, this is the, the first crude border that we can make, right? 
And how do we make perfect adjustments so that this border looks like something that you are most probably already familiar with? That's the subject of the next part, right? But let's get back to a picture very similar to this one, which is the border between Let's go back to the, the representation, the good old pixel that we like. I need to make the topography permanent. Yeah, exactly. So imagine you are sent to somewhere in the Netherlands that has a significant uh, topography, like a non trivial, non flat topography, like Nijmegen. Would that be? Would that be a good place to go? Yeah. Um, I was looking for a data set as such for my research, which was about cycling and so on and so forth. And I never managed to get a good data set, but back then in 2015, anyhow. So imagine you go to a field and you go uh, in a grid, like 100 meters by 100 meters each pixel. Uh, you start walking around and you have these barometers or whatever other device that, that shows the exact altitude with, I don't know, two decimal points of precision, right? And then you start making these samples. Sample height measurements, right? So we've been careful. We, we walk along these lines 100 meters forward and we can measure with, uh, I don't know, some good GPS and IMU uh, uh, inertial measurement unit. So we know exactly that we are 100 meters away in this direction, 100 meters away in the other direction. So we go to the next cell and we do some height measurement and we get some values height. So I can write them as height being a Function of x and y. So hypothetically speaking, if I could do this measurement like infinitely many times, then I would have a function of two variables in this form, right? Having two independent variables and one dependent variable being height. Right? That's the beginning of many, many interesting things, by the way. Okay. And then now imagine having a level in this height field as we have been talking about so far. This is a field. This is going to be a field, right? The locations to which you have attributed something are two dimensional. And the third value is the value of the field attributed to those locations, H for height, right? So imagine the values above a certain height and below a certain height. What does that remind you of? These uh, kind of topographic maps, right? If I show you that this is a topographic map of an area with I don't know, lines of 120, 140, 160, you need to get the picture that there must exist some sort of a field here, right? It, by the way, there is nothing wrong with having another one for uh, having one of the four hmm? it, it can be whatever else, right? But so because, because exactly, so let's, I wish I had known this a little bit about, okay. So let's, uh, Let's take a section from this. Yeah, what could this possibly be? Right, if we had a 3D model of that environment and we could cut it like this with a plane, what would we see? Something like this, right? And this is one level set, this is another one, and this is another one. So a level and a set of points that belong to that level below or above or something like that, hence the name level sets, right? 
can a circle be a level set in a function? It's a question. Can you think of a function? One of whose level set is a circle? Amazing. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can you explain your intuition? Um, f of x and y. Amazing. And now imagine a level set. So f of x and y being larger than four. So what does this describe? You said a parabola, parabola, but actually what you meant was a paraboloid surface. So a surface that looks like a ball. Why do I have that image? Immediately, that's something that you are so used to, and so, so many people take it for granted. I don't take it for granted. I actually write it down another function. I write this as another function. I choose, for instance, z to represent f of x and y, therefore I can immediately make a three-dimensional picture of this, right? This is a choice, this is, this is not given, this is a choice, right? Okay, now I can, I can give a bunch of points, and where do we get a bunch of points with the good old-fashioned picture as a grid, and then we generate this third value, z, so we effectively create points in this form. as vectors, right? If you do this for a bunch of points in such a domain, long story short, how do I get this immediately if these points only exist on the x and, well, actually, I will do the wrong picture. But actually, this, this mistake that I just made is good for the rest. Perfect, thank you. Okay, X. Right? So if I restrict this image to this part, what will that be? What is the locus of points whose x value equals zero in this coordinate system? It's a very easy one. Jenny, you wanted to say? Oh, no, no. <laughs> hmm? The locus of points whose value x equals zero? Y squared? Y squared. When you, when you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a perfect answer, but you immediately jump to the second part of the question. The first question is the locus of points whose x equals zero is just this equation, x equals zero, which means this plane, right? And Herlinda already answered the next question, which means, okay, what do we get if x equals zero? Then we get f of practically y equals y squared, which is this one. And then similarly, we can form another plane, which is the plane of now y equals zero, on which we will see another picture, a very similar one, like this one. And then we get this kind of circle as level sets if we set z equal to something, such as z equal to four. Right? Make sense? Yeah? So this can be for instance that equal to four. So the, now the interesting thing begins. So now imagine that these are the points on which we are sampling something or evaluating a function. This, this, is, a, so this is the term that is used. So this function exists in a continuous domain 
we can have lots of notions about it and it is not necessarily more original than a function for which we don't have the mathematical equation it's, it's a different one right this is an analytic function for which we have the mathematical equation in a closed form right the other one height might be a function that we do not have a in a mathematical closed form but nevertheless it's a field, it's a function even, you can call it a function, even though you don't have the function in a, in a closed mathematics form, right? Okay. Okay, so as soon as you have these pairs, like X and Y, the third one being somehow dependent apparently on the other one, then you have the function, whether or not you have the function in a closed mathematical form. And then you can speak about a level set in that function right now maybe this is more appealing to you because this one is more understandable this one is more predictable but uh, whatever we do we, we can we can put values of x and y from this grid into this as a let's say python function get some values out and map them here and here and here and what do you think will happen for f of x and y less uh, less than or more than four to the interior of the circle, right? What would I get? So most probably a bunch of points like, I don't know, that's the thing that we have discussed before, right? So if this was the center, then a bunch of points inside this we expect them to have values less than four around the circle, uh, around the center of one, right? So we can do this in two dimensions as well. This was our field. So this this one, the the, the adding of the z component actually helps us make a three dimensional diagram, and that can help us in in, for instance, identifying things like. Uh, gradients and so on and so forth which fall out of the scope of what we're talking about but okay then uh, the issue here is that okay what if this is not given and this is a a function that is effectively a field that we have measured like a field of height right so i already ruined this so let's do it again <laughs> Not. That's a great question. That's the whole point. But let's keep that question for for a while. Because okay, in, in this case, it is easy to imagine that okay, if z exactly equals four, I was being very careful to, uh, for not putting the equality sign here. That's exactly the reason. So I'm very happy you noticed it. Because in this case, it is easy to say that, okay, if it is exactly equal to four, we evaluate this function because we have it in an analytic form, or we have the Python function that does this, and then we get the answer, and the answer looks like a circle. So in that case, it will be rather trivial or even unnecessary to some, uh, to some extent to think about a level set, right? But in this case, in, in the general case, which is a case that uh, you have a function or as a field, as a measurement, but you don't have the the, the mathematical representation. Uh, what, is, what is the chance that we bring a thermometer and measure it somewhere and we get exactly like 19 degrees point zero 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 zero? A, a perfectly circular field, right? So that, that perfectly, I mean, an obsessively perfect circle, right? You can have it in a cartoon, but uh, you, you don't have it in reality, right? So you, you draw these topographic maps, they don't look like perfect concentric circles, right? They, they look like such things, right? Okay, so that, that, that was a great question. But okay, so for a moment, we are going to pretend that it's not so easy to, to get the, the perfect line representing that level set, like 19 degrees centigrade or um, some height level, like 120 meters. But then, so we are going to pretend that it's a little bit easy, uh, difficult. We're going to forget about the equality sign, and then we get back exactly to the point of finding the equality line, right?
Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to the big pictures to you know to give you as share and things uh, so I get some good value to did I make it too trivial maybe? Anyway. By the way, since the whole subject is topological, it doesn't matter if I discuss the regularity of this grid. But let's say we are being reasonable and this grid is reasonably regular, right? So we have some height level. Uh, 190 point six one hundred and one point two one hundred nineteen uh point eight one hundred twenty two point one one hundred twenty three point four one hundred twenty three <laughs> numbers are good good for right um Okay, perfect. So, uh, shall we challenge them to draw a border between all cells whose value is above 120 and all cells whose value is below 120? And also, yeah. yeah, that's a very good one. <laughs> At two borders. Let's say two uh, topographic lines, not the perfect lines, but what is, what is the first separation that you do? In your mind, you can easily tell whether a cell has a value attributed to it below 120 or above, right? So if you do that, it shouldn't be that difficult, right? If we just select the cells, and I wish we had a, chalk, a piece of chalk in a different color, but that's a luxury we don't afford to, actually. Um, Chalk is not common here, and I've been reprimanded why I use chalk so harshly on this. But do you know where you should start? So it's a it's a okay perfect so it's a binary coloring in that sense right those above and those below right yeah so it immediately binary, hmm? it'll be binary twice yeah but let's let's focus on one so with respect to the level set 120 we have a binary partitioning of the set into two sets one being the cells that do not meet that condition, the other being the ones that do meet the condition. So for every cell, let's say the height of X and Y either is above 120 or it's below. This is a Boolean test. It's, there, there cannot be things in between, right? And we have forgotten about equality for good reasons because 
the practically the chance of getting that is is nearly zero but okay for for the sake of computational completeness we can have that equality also included but we know for sure that we're not going to get many equals here but so we need to have another policy for finding the equality right but we can quickly partition the set into two parts the one being above and the one being below the one being below so if you are looking for a border and if we are not bothered by the shape of this border, I find it actually beautiful. We have already one border between the two sets. And that is exactly the level set. Right? And guess what? This is, if I ask you about the dimensionality of this domain, what would you say? Is it? It's so important. It's a very, very important point. Huh? This domain is pixelated. What does that tell you? The dimensionality it's a two-dimensional surface right and what do you expect the dimensionality of the border thing the level set the level set will be definitely one dimensional thank you so one dimension less than the dimension of the the set so if the if the how does the two dimension how does the uh, the level set look like yeah, so if you think about the, a tetrahedral pack of milk, that could be the border between milk and everything else in the world, right? That package is two-dimensional, or let's say sorbet or ice cream, right? Because that's the one your generation knows. I know the milk in, in tetrahedral packs, right? Uh, that's the border between the sorbet, ice, and everything else in the world, right? Okay, so that you expect it to be two-dimensional because the, the sorbetto ice is a three-dimensional thing, right? Okay. So, um, but speaking of that idea, that idea seems to be very general, right? So what would be a level set in, in this function? This is a bit of a tricky question, but I, I'm sure you don't mind. So f, f of x equals x squared, what will be the shape or the form of the level set in this function of a single variable? The common trick again is to, you are trying to picture this, right? Okay, if you are trying to picture this, then you're probably trying to say, okay, let's choose, you know, this is again, not an obvious choice. Let's choose y to represent f of x. Why would we do that? Because we want to, picture it somehow yeah and it, it this choice does not impress this function you know this function can exist with or without this choice of us for drawing it right but when we make this choice on a two-dimensional system we can draw this picture right so if i say okay now let's choose f of x larger than two that's a level set right it's supposed to be and what do you expect the dimensionality or the form or the shape of the three to be so that technically means y should be larger than two so what what does y equal to two look like Hmm? No, a line, yes, thank you. Because y equal to two in a three-dimensional world would look like what? A plane, thank you. A plane parallel to y equal to zero, which is the zx plane, not the xz plane, zx plane. I, I can tell you why, zx and not xz, okay? So y equal to two looks like what? Yeah, so one, two. It's the locus of points whose y value equals to two. What does the level set look like? Hmm? Well, where is the yeah. level set? Exactly, it has to be a point. Why, why did you say that? Because the set itself 
the locus is one dimensional. Therefore, if you are looking for a field on this one, which uh, is a level set, then, then it has to be consisted of points. And who said that it should be continuous or connected or whatever? For the, for the same reason that these two can be disconnected, these two can also be disconnected, right? Even though they belong to the same set, that, that's why we don't call them shapes, we call them sets, right? 140 and 140, there's no reason that they have to be, as to which they have to be connected. They can easily be disconnected because this field can have these two peaks as to which you get, maybe if I cut it again over here very cleverly, then I would get two peaks over there. Yeah? Okay. There is a The output is going to the line. Mm -hmm. I can explain it until I'm done. I'm going to do a bit more effort. <laughs> For me. So I was saying you're on the line of the point, and I can say you're on the count. It's in the name of 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 the name Example, so or lower or higher than the yeah. Okay, that is in the mind. And then what are you then? Doing? The, the if part was perfect. Yeah. Now the then part. Yeah. yeah. And you need to know what kind of a border because the machine needs yeah. very clear instructions. And the kind of a border here in this case is just a line, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a line segment between the two pixels. Yes. So this will give me only this line. And make it dual. So yeah. there's the if part and there's the then part. Put this term down. Exactly. Okay, so for the for describing the if part, Karlinda said something interesting. A property of that cell having such and meeting such and such conditions, right? It can actually be a compound property of that cell. It doesn't have to be just height or temperature. It can be a combination of the two. So long as you can make a Boolean combination of those properties attributed to the cell, then you can define a level set. It can be even a semantic property of that cell the label of that cell so it will give me all the red cells the border between the red cells and everything else the border between the sorbetto ice cream i would actually prefer the lemon <laughs> lemon taste which will probably be in green the green sorbetto ice and everything else in the world right it can be anything that can be evaluated as a boolean value to true or false right yeah so this is the diff part and then the then that that's uh, the point that Kevin is making now. So maybe, maybe you can you can uh, take this a little bit deeper, the, the, that part, the, the border. Yeah. Now. So the thing is that you are assuming a kind of a connection between these two, right? You're yes. assuming a kind of a relation between these two. What is this relation? Amazing point. Right. There is a relation that these two have. What did we call those relations? Yeah. What these two have and these two, for example, don't have. Mm -hmm. They're neighbors, yes. And they're sharing something, right? Yeah, they're neighbors by virtue of sharing an edge, right? Yeah. So we are computing based on what term? We are checking this based on 
notwithstanding so, that we are checking it on the edge between them, right? So each one of these, if if then that condition that you're thinking about is going to be process on all of these edges, right? Does that make sense? So now let's go a bit towards the dual board that we still did mention. And what is the dual board? We would represent each one of these cells with a node, and each one of the is a neighboring cell. And if there is an edge between these two cells, they share, there's going to be a connection between them, right? So this is how we are constructing the dual. And I assume there's going to be another one here, there's going to be another one here. Right? Okay, I can draw a magnified version of one part. So I take this part without naming the rest. And I magnify this situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what happens is that on each one of these edges, we can put a condition of element. And that condition is telling if we have this value there or not. So in this particular case that you have drawn, you have 122 here, 122 here, 122 here, and oh, yeah, we're looking with a magnifier at this point. Yeah, right? So if I follow that instruction, I would get a point here on this edge, indicating where 120 might happen. I wouldn't get a point here. I wouldn't get a point here if it both of them are And I would get another point here, but here in this case, it's going to be again towards the edge, right? And what, is, what does this indicate if I have this situation? That I have four neighbors, one of them is higher than the circle, three of them is lower than the circle, and we know that the intersection with the value 120 is happening there. What does this indicate? That's a very important and rather philosophical question. Yeah. By the way. What might be happening in between the, those two? Yeah. Or what, from, from a design point of view, what do you want to happen between those yeah. two? So let's, let's first think about what can be happening between those two. What can be happening between those two? Remember that this is coming from a part of a level set that is expected to be one dimensional. And yet we only have two points belonging to this one dimensional space. So we, and by assuming uh, based on the implicit assumption of continuity here, we expect that there exists or more generally, yeah, some kind of a link, let's say, between the two, a curve, let's say. So as far as I'm concerned, this, there has to be a snake between those two points. What shape that snake has, that's another question. But in absence of other information, what is the easiest curve we can think of? What is the easiest or the simplest one-dimensional object we can possibly think of? A line segment, because it's a simplex of degree one. Right? So in absence of other information, exactly, <laughs> thank you. So this was the thing I would expect to be drawn. Okay, this can be a snake or the simplest object of that dimension being one is a line segment between those two. But, but why don't we care? I think this is important, sorry, this is a bit of a diversion discussion, but why don't we care about the care, the smallest curve inside that? Well, I'll say yes, kind of. Yes, because this is smaller than our resolution of measurement, yeah. Yeah. right? That is beyond our sampling. We don't have information. We have no idea to figure that out, right? That's why I keep repeating the phrase with, in the absence of other information, because we don't have further information. That, that is what, it, uh, what we have, right? Mm -hmm. so can, I, can I give them a couple of other examples? Yeah, so, definitely. Because I'm very curious. So let's say that I'm going to just stick to the dual because I think it's easier. 
So now that we have this duo, say that we have 120 here, no, 122 here, 120. So this was this can be identified into a coloring. Yeah. A two coloring. Let's say the white and nothing or black and white. It's a two two color graph, right? Yes. So the graph that we have is, is now two colored. So it's uh, separated basically into two sets, right? And now this situation becomes easier to detect. So now we have another possible situation here. What is that situation? What is the result of that? What can we say about this? From the yeah, it's from there to there. Yeah, that's the simplest thing that can happen, but it can also be yeah crazy. <laughs> it can also be yeah, but we don't care about that. Yeah. It can also be this. But here's a hard one. What is happening here? Are you sure? It could have been that you get the other possible two diagonal lines, right? And both can be true, yeah. right? Because we are looking for a border between the, the two colors in the graph, yeah. essentially. So this is very interesting because this can be a theory. This can be another theory. And it's a theory that are they separated or collision? Like this? Or they are separated and actually there's a wizard here. Does that make sense? Yeah, so there's a fundamental, sorry, ambiguity. Yeah, fundamental ambiguity. If if our if our um, sight is limited to this magnifier between these four cells, right? So there are tricks to to avoid that. But then maybe the the, the picture we should be looking at is can this picture this dual cell be unambiguous because this is a dual cell describing what is supposed to be happening to that surface and the and the borders existing in that surface right the border between the two i don't know countries or uh, regions in a in a carcassonne game or something like that right how can this be unambiguous Okay, let's keep that question and, and, and talk about the encoding of this space. So apparently we are talking about the possible situation. So let's forget about the numerical values. We have established so far that this is actually a matter of calling the set into two parts. The, the ones that meet that condition and the, one, the ones that do not meet the condition. Can I suggest something? Yeah. Can I, uh, before going to the encoding part, I think it's deeper and it takes some time. We give them a 15 minute break and then we go. 15 ahead. minutes, okay. Yeah. You're being very generous. We have an hour. So. Okay. Oh, this? Okay. Yeah. Can I have a 15 minute break and then we go to the encoding? Are you ready? Yeah. 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 Both have equal yeah. claims. Four thirty. That's right. Four thirty. <laughs> Like we have, we have we have no say in it because we fundamentally actually in the concept that's beyond our reason. Yeah, but the, the ways to resolve that issue they go beyond the scope of what we're doing, but I would call them tricks or using information from beyond the scope of this magnifier. Yeah. But to be very honest, like can I mention yeah uh, one way to resolve that? marching triangle? Oh yeah, we are going to do that but after the break after for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> okay. We will be back. We also yeah. need a break. Yeah, yeah.
Well, it's going to finish, but up to now, we have to double that to two for the moment, which is six, and then the number two. And, um, It's great to continue to have a continuing discussion uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Yeah, the, the paper version is kind of things that some people might want. So I've always learned like this, always been something else. Especially in the law, it's not on the other side of the 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 side of and now this is stable. I don't I don't really don't get to I mean like I don't keep sure it's changing things or saying it's new to me. Something like Where are you starting from?
Trying to do the whole full change and then full brand change and then look. I'm trying to, you know, like the workflow, the different workflow. I don't know. Well, I think they can change. So what I did was I pulled it, I went to the bottom thing, I took the one to uh what's it called copy but I think it's the wrong thing to do. The bottom uh in that
I think that I just bring it up. I know it's coming to the police, but there's a call and a reliable return. So, yeah. I don't know if it's safe to eye open it. It's still a damn thing. I don't know if that's wrong. But, Okay, so are we recording again? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So where did we leave things? Oh we we're talking about the situations here. So we have already shown you three situations. And we showed you a way to simplify these situations beyond the numbers. And we talked about the colors, right? The coloring of the set into two colors, right? Black and white or field and empty or whatever, right? So that reminds you of binary numbers zero and one, right? So can you think of a, a proper way to encode these situations. How many of such situations can you think of? First of all, a good guess. Please. We expect participation. And no, nothing explodes, by the way, if you get this wrong. <laughs> Let me can stop for you. Go. I was wondering, are we talking about square one or okay. can I give you a simple example, like a line segment, the two ends being black, white, black, or white, or white, white, black, black, how many situations? Four. How would you Four. Well, just running off the idea. So can I remind you of another example I gave you? You have three shirts with different colors and yeah. two pairs of trousers Wait, with distinct I, colors. If I think about it, if my mind works, I can give a number. Sure. So each, that's a scale of each of choice here. Yeah. If you take zero for the first one, then the next one can be either zero or one. If you get one for the first uh, one, the next one can be zero or one. So we have a decision tree. So how many branches do we have? Four. So this many multiplied by this many. Two multiplied by two for the same reason that this when you have three different colors for shirts and two different colors for trousers, you can have six ways of 
wearing the material. Right? So what does that tell us for for the square? No. Well, close, but thank you. Two to the power of four. That should also remind you of a canonical example I gave you for what uh, for as to why we have RGB colors represented by numbers ranging from zero to two hundred sixty-five, right? And the notion of information content and the simplest form of an information uh, piece of information being a bit zero or one, right? Which could simply be a cup that you put upside uh, upright for, I don't know, one and upside down for zero. So this is the simplest unit of information that you can immediately make on your table. So you, congratulations, you have made one bit of a memory and you can try to sell it on the market for a hard drive with one bit of a memory, okay? Yeah? So two to the power of four, so we can, in theory, expect to have 16 situations, right? But an, an interesting thing does happen here. So let's guess that all of them are zero. By the way, the numbering of this for the numbering of these into the cell number zero, the cell number one and the cell number two and the cell number three, you can, you can do the following. You can say the X and Y, Zero is represented here, one is represented here, uh, zero on this axis is represented here, etc. So the cell zero and zero can be this one, the cell zero and one can be this one, and the cell one and one can be this one, and the cell zero one will be here, and this will be one and zero which will give us numbers, right? So zero in a decimal, uh, in a, you call decimal? Yeah, decimal system. Um, yeah, it gives you in a, in the base of 10 will be zero. This one will be two. This one will be one and this one will be two. So it's a particular ordering. The perfect way of doing this is called the Z order or the Morton order, right? Okay, so you can do this for any number of cells in, in a three-dimensional space here. Yeah, so we weave the coordinates and we create single numbers that create such numbers in the base of two. And these numbers can, of course, be translated in the base of 10, and this one will be equal to 1, for instance, in the basis of 10. The base of 10 is given, and so we really don't write this, but the base, binary base is something that we should probably indicate. B for binary. Yeah? Okay. So. Where were we? So if we start encoding this, so what would be this situation, by the way? Something rather non-trivial about this situation, isn't it? So if they're all below 120, below 120 or if they all do not meet the condition, what will be the point of having a border? There won't be any border, right? So, but nevertheless, this is a possible situation, right? This is a possible state of this machine with four binary variables. And we have it here. Exactly. So all of them are such that they are below 120. Therefore, why should we even expect to have a border? Right? So all these situations can be therefore encoded into these kind of numbers. I can go down. So this is the first one. And then this one will be uh, Next one, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then let's let's also work it out from the end. This equals what number? Hmm? Yeah. Yes, thank you. And let's write fourteen also. Did you guess how I guessed it immediately? 
Ja sa ja sa niečím vať že byť takým. Does that make sense? Okay. How did I get it? Hmm? In perspective, but I, I guess it was a two plus six. I assume that there should exist some symmetry here. Because if there is no border in a set of all zeros, there can not be a border in a set of all ones. And this one should have the exact same situation as this one with respect to the question of uh, finding a border. You want to solve? Uh, this is our numbering. Zero, one, two, and three. This one represents the fifth situation. And this one would be like a grid such. Zero to one represents the fifth situation. And the second one represents. Yeah, so two of the symmetric ones, yeah. right? <clears throat> so whichever the case, whether these three are ones and this is zero, or whether this one is one and these three are zero, corresponds to the same kind of a border, yeah. which is this one. Right? Uh, I don't really understand. You have your four zeros with zero, and three zero one equals one. And uh, of course, the, the four numbers whether which node is on top. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm wondering where if the zero one theory has certain specific representations of the situation. Situation we uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If this is a way to encode the situation in one of these squares, let's say. We are still in the magnifier, right? Yeah. Remember that there was a magnifier here? If I may, I want to maybe clean the board a bit and draw this figure. So what Karim has drawn at the corner is basically like the cut of this figure. So the situation is like you have two of these cells and you contrast it that when you are going to represent this, you would go in this order. Right? Why in this order? Because of the coordinate system that is really strange here, but the connotation of this is that this will be the first digit, this will be the second digit, this will be the third digit, and this will be the fourth digit. Or the bit. Yeah. The bit. Okay. Yeah. Right? So if I want to mark this as a theory, and the rest empty, this would be one, zero, zero, zero. If I want to mark this one as two, and the rest empty, this would be one, zero, zero, zero. Make sense now? With this system, what we can do is that we can represent and generate binary ID, associated binary ID to all of the possible configurations of this. Of this. Does that make sense? Can you not just limit it by the size? What? Size? Yeah, because each one is a maximum amount of space. I just want to write the name of this one, okay? Yeah, we configure how the resolution and the screen, etc. So we have to. But, but I don't understand the point. Like, what would you limit it? Well, we said earlier that the maximum color is going to be. Like, so, so this, uh, that big number you said is zero. Yeah. It would be the case here, but let's keep that. We're going to connect it back to the 256 a bit later. But before going there, this is half a byte, actually. Yes, this is, like, this is half a byte. It doesn't have a name as far as I know. No, 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 we don't have. Yeah. But we're going to describe what would be a byte. But let's let's again focus on this one. So a situation like this, can you guess what? How do you encode this? What? What would you value 
What is the value if you wanted to encode this thing? So first, let's do a color in here. Okay. We are putting the magnifier on this corner now. Yes. 123, which is above. Let's. Was it above or below? It's above. Yeah. One. 125 is also okay. What is this? No more. Yeah, one more. Let's see if it's faster. What should we do? Now we need zero, one, one. Yeah, zero, one, one, one. What do we do? Zero, one. Zero, one, zero, one. You can just write the number as well. 16. What was this one? 14. What was this one? 12, right? So, what happened here, which is super interesting, is that we can map all of these out in terms of their IDs and associate a particular pattern of, right? The pattern for this one. Yeah. If this, then that. Because we won't be surprised, possibly, you know, we can expect that there can possibly exist 16 different situations. Right. Whether we have exactly all those 16 situations in our set or not, that's another question. But there's no way that there can be a situation that is not encoded here. Mm -hmm. Right? And actually, this means that instead of 16, we have to actually prefer for only eight situations. Because for two of these gifts, we have the same path. Right? So whether it is this situation or this situation, the answer is going to be the same. Right? And therefore, we can form a lookup table, and that's where things get very interesting. We know how to deal with every situation, so we put them together in a, a so-called lookup table. And then we retrieve the most important thing about this border, which is its topology, from that lookup table. So what do we mean by the topology of the border? It's, it's this connection, that there should exist one point from the middle of these two to another point in the middle of these two, and there has to be some form of a curve. And if our answer is scientific in the sense of the sciences of the natural, then in the absence of other information, this is the border, because that's the simplest border that can possibly exist between those two points, right? If our question is from the sciences of the artificial as to what could be this border, then we can, then we can maybe design a piece of this border and say, I don't know, this can be the shape of the border. And whenever we have this situation, we will replace this in the set and we will start creating our border from a set of such tiles. We can think of them as particles. Yeah, right. Here, here, here. Very simple thing. Yeah. It's a bit simpler than Gaga sometimes. But yeah. And what Sheldon did here, which was going from this square to this square to this square, etc., we can think of it as marching along the square, hence the name marching squares. Why not marching pixels, by the way? Because we're not talking about pixels. What we're talking about is a square, which is in the dual space in between the pixels. Right. Yeah. This is, I think, super important that we are talking about voxels. The voxels hold the value for us, but the space that we are operating on is between the voxels. In between. Yeah. Right. Therefore, we call the, the equivalent of this in 3D marching cubes. We don't call it marching voxels. Yeah. Because the cubes are these dual objects that contain eight, eight voxels, actually. Or they, they actually mark the area in between the, the volume in between eight boxes. In the same fashion that these squares actually talk about the area between four pixels. The pixels are our sample points. Yeah. Right? So yeah. just just to recap, when we had when we were working on a two-dimensional grid here, we had squares and how many situations we had that we need to that we did that we needed to enumerate. Yeah. We had yeah, sixteen exactly. We had sixteen situations that we needed to enumerate within this two dimensional world. Now if we go to the three dimensional world, we would have cubes 
and how many situations would we have for describing those cubes? Sorry, which is yeah, exactly. So we would have 256 different situations, right? So we asked you a question about what can be um, a window in which we don't have such ambiguities. And actually that was the first example we gave you, which was based on triangles, right? So if on this triangulated domain, which can be a manifold in this case, which is triangular as a mesh, if you wanted to find borders between the parts of this manifold having a temperature above something and below something, I don't write the numbers, I just write um, Yeah, assuming that some of them are below and above. If we wanted to encode the situation for uh, the question as to whether each dual triangle between them contains a piece of the border or not, that that would be the the basic case, right? Dual object actually. In this case, this might be a unit if you find the problem. The dual objects are not necessarily going to look like triangles, but they will be are in the dual world, aren't you? Okay, let's let's say okay, this is the dual, yeah. right? So let's say we are let's say we are already in the dual space and these are actually some Voronoi type cells. So there exists this kind of cell that um, are dual to be known in the graph. And now the, the triangular picture, which is kind of disrupted by this Voronoi cell, is the dual picture now, right? So now if we go back to the same uh, old question, okay, let's say we have a triangle. What are the possible situations in a time? Three vertices, each of which can have two possible um, situations. Therefore, we have how many situations? Right? Two to the power of three or eight. And by induction, we can also assume that there still exists a symmetry again here. Let's say if this is the ordering, zero, one, two, or whatever other ordering, then we can say the zero, zero, zero is going to be symmetrically the same with respect to that question. So the one, 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 zero, zero, one is going to be similar to this one, and so on and so forth. Right? But there's something very interesting about this one. In this one, there can never be and ambiguity because this is a simplex domain. You, you can you can check it out. Here. If you write like this, then we have a border like this. If it, if this one is one and the other ones are zero, we have a border like this, or like this, and two of them are one and this one is zero, we have a border like this again, and so on and so on. So none of them actually ends up being ambiguous. Yeah, so for the scientific simulation, triangles usually have these superb advantages to for the reference because everything is simpler for a triangle because it's a simplex after all, right? Okay, so if we do it like this with triangles, then we call it Boston triangles, and if we got it for triangles in three dimensions, we see the the so better packages, the tetrahedron, right? Yeah, so the equivalent of this, the analogous of this in 3D will be called marching tetrahedron. Right, so we will walk along tetrahedrons 
and do this with higher resolution, with many more pixels, and with many more touch points exactly adjusted in between those two points, then we can find the exact shape of this curve. Root. Topographic line, but if, if you look close enough, you will see the line segments coming from kind of peaks. Right? Yeah, sorry. Square. Yeah. Square. Okay. How many every time? Okay. So you understood everything that you need to understand about the. Um, but I have a I have a yeah. I have a very interesting question at this point mm -hmm. from that. Now that you know this idea, how do you think this would be helpful in your case? Excellent. Where do you think this can be helpful in your case? You can do that actually. Yeah, but that one is more directly related to interpolation in 3D, for which you can use a, a method for bilinear interpolation or some other interpolation method. There's actually a, a whole list of interpolation methods that you can use cubic interpolation, two line, two line interpolation. Bilinear interpolation is very common. Beating is also common, etc. So you are directly working on the interpolation question, so that's it. But um, but that is accurate because we are creating a new space between the voxels in which we can interpolate. In which we can interpolate. That is. You actually suggesting interpolation of this picture. Yeah. It? But I want to mention here that we are using them a bit more directly in this case. Yeah. More literally, yeah, more literally. So, um, maybe it's fair to ask this question to all the students who have studied architecture. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? What, what do you see as what do you see in this question? This one, do you see a potential? <clears throat> Okay, that's a very good one. Yeah. Okay, that's a first excellent answer. Because if you wanted to, for whatever reason, whatever philosophical reason you wanted to make blobby shapes, this would be the way to do it. Not, not that we necessarily advocate for such shapes, but okay, if you wanted to badly, then the, this is definitely the way to do it. Uh, so that's one, one great answer. Um, but just, just to think, like, wait on it a bit. The assumption, what is the assumption there? What that line represents there? You know that. You mean the network setting of the key? Yeah. The great keyboard. Exactly. Yeah. We are going back to we are going back to the geometric world. Yeah. Because before what we had was a bunch of zeros and ones. Before what we had was a bunch of colors in the voxels, right? And that is what you would get outside of the growth model. You would get a colorful. If I can make a parenthesis. Yeah. So that was the great word. You will see that, right? So in these pixels, we are in the space of the configuration, right? So we mentioned to you that our definition of a configuration is basically a color track. So this one would be a configuration, which is a simple configuration that describes the envelope in, out, in, out, right? And this can be your way of making the boundary of in and out. For which you have, you can create a tile set, which will be in the realm of shaping mm. these configurations. So actually, this object, whatever you put here, even even this simple line, belongs to the realm of shapes and geometry. This picture 
with zeros and ones, etc. This belongs to the realm of configurations. And we can do all of these things by relying on the discretization of the space that we have created from the very beginning. The tessellation of the space that we have created from the very beginning. This tessellation being regular because we didn't have any particular reason to make it irregular, right? In fact, we had all the reason to do to make it regular because we wanted to discover everything about this building, including its shape. So therefore, the, the choice of having a perfectly regular, not only a topologically regular, but also geometrically regular tessellation was that uh, we didn't want to have a bias towards a particular shape, right? And our case was this synthesis of shapes and configurations as a matter of, as a matter of discovery, right? So therefore, it's a very good idea to start with a perfectly regular tessellation. And that tessellation or discretization makes everything else possible here, including even an answer to the question of shape. Right? An answer that will be based on the so called files. Files recorded in a lookup table. Yeah. Right? So, where we have a specific. So if we learn the uh, let's say it's from these different ones that had mm -hmm. 16 or whatever different kinds of sounds that we then gave the different yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So that's the second step. That's a couple of jumps ahead, but before I go jump, I want to ask you a question, which is that uh, just a bit back. For the record, let me make a yes. reference. So this was the work of a group uh, called Cube 3D. Cube 3D, as we read it, but maybe they meant it as Cube in uh, the case of layers. Uh, right? Cube. cube was, oh. <laughs> it's available on our website. I People didn't know that. Watching this in the future. Uh, because mirror D looks like 3 So if you want to, how many tiles did you have in this case? Yeah, but some of them are repetitive, right? It was mentioned that they are mirrors of each other. If these three are filled, this one is empty, and or this one is filled, the other one empty, right? That's one symmetry that we have. We have another kind of symmetry as well. What is that? Hmm? Rotational symmetry we have. So if this is filled, the other one is empty, you can keep rotating this and it would cover. And considering all of this, how many unique geometries would you need to be able to tile this surface? Well, we know the magician is talking because Kevin has a broken <laughs> way to reduce these numbers so much that we can actually 3D print I and mean, laser, laser cut some of these tiles, and we can actually start making things that uh, yeah. as simple as Carcassonne, you, uh, by playing with Carcassonne, you can create all kinds of geometries. So given a configuration, you can immediately convert it to a shape. Yeah, that's a big deal. So, but uh, I think I think it would be interesting if they start to think on this level first, and then we would jump to the next level. So, how many do you think unique geometries do you work on? Four. Can you can you help me to draw them? Uh, one with diagonal. Which one? So yeah, with diagonal. Oh yeah, then two diagonals. Uh huh. Uh, then three dots. Uh huh. Uh, and nothing. And nothing. That's it. You have all of them. If uh, we consider the risk of rotation of symmetries, I think this will cover it, right? Because the other one that is similar to this is just. Uh, different up to rotation from this one. The other three that have a similar situation geometrically speaking, the, they can be created out of this by rotation, etc. Et mm -hmm. and, and a rotation of this will create the other type. Right? Mm -hmm. So now if you have a policy or a style as to how you want to create these lines, so this would be the simplest style possible. Mm -hmm. And you can create, I don't know, 
Let's uh, think of that. No, 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 but, yeah. but, but allow me to continue on this sure. line that this here, we had, we had two kind of symmetries involved. One of them was rotational. The other one was the fact that we don't care about inside or outside of the curve, right? Okay. But the thing is that you can place this here because this is a topographic map. But if, if it was an architectural plan, you couldn't place this there, could you? Because the inside or an outside of an architectural plan changes the difference, right? Say that you didn't want to just draw the line, you wanted to tile this map in such a way that the color inside the building was different than the color outside. Would that fact change the number of the tiles that you need? And how much they would be? How, how many of them do I need to change? Sorry? Double the amount, I would disagree. The one at the line. Yeah, this one would persist, I agree. What about this one? Mm. This one, would this persist or not? Right. So where is this? Yeah, co color, color, let's think about color. Color. Coloring in, in and out. Yeah. So let's say blue and red. I don't think that's what the name is. So the blue and red could be blue, blue, red. Yeah. Or it can be uh, this one, right? Yeah, red, red, blue. So actually, this makes two sides of this package. But if, if they want to, they can also represent it with one and four, actually. Because by just rotating it, they're making a decision. So they can prioritize inside or outside. Oh, yeah, but I, I think it doesn't having the other one covered, then maybe it's necessary to have the other one. What about this one? It rotationally covers that. It does it? Doesn't it make a difference if these three are inside or this one is outside or these three are outside, this one is inside? The question can be asked differently. So if you do a coloring, if you have to do a coloring, blue and red, this one will definitely not be equal to. This red and blue. Right? Makes sense. So this would be two as well. What about this one? Totally different, right? So my point here is that the number of the symmetries that you consider would change the number of the tiles that you would need. Does that make sense? And the separating properties. Yeah, the separating properties would change. So this, I think, if you allow me to reveal the last yeah. part of it, is that what we will do in the workshop, and hopefully next week, is that we are going to show you how you can decide on these symmetries to limit the number. So in general, if you want to have a cube to tile the whole building with that group of cubes, you're going to have 256 cubes, right? But 256 is too much for you to design every single one of them in every single situation. Or even 128 is too many. It's too many. So we would consider certain symmetries because we understand that a wall in this direction and a wall in this direction can be similar, right? That would eliminate a lot. They have the same facade. Yeah. If you consider all possible symmetries, it would come down to 16 tiles, which one of them is empty, so 15 tiles, right? But if you keep adding, like keep, keep removing the symmetries, then you need to design a bit more. Like every time that you remove a symmetry, you need to design a bit more. If you differentiate between a floor and a ceiling, that's one symmetry loss. If you differentiate between the, space, the wall, that the window that is facing south with the window that is facing north, that's another symmetry loss. And so on and so forth, right? Does that make sense? So, to, to bring this back to the question of is this then that you know yeah. if, if this if this then that uh, decision tree of yours is more yeah. sophisticated than just distinguishing in and out yeah then you need to differentiate those tiles with respect to the decision tree that you have here yeah exactly but the general idea remains the same which is if this then that so what do you want to happen if such and such situations uh, exist in that mm. sense. In, in that combination of cells, I should say, in the configuration space, yeah. right? And now, before we go further, I would like them to see what's the idea of designing these tiles. So this was one way of 
the, or arguably the simplest from a topological point of view or from a geometric point of view. From a topological point of view, the problem is solved, right? There has to be a border here, there has to be a border here, etc. Et right? But from a geometric point of view, there is a vast, or I would say, infinite space of possible designs here, right? So you can even think about styling this building. So let's think about some kind of, I don't know, gothic style with something like gargoyles or whatever. Yeah? Or grotesque objects, you know, you can, you can even decide to put, I don't know, some kind of a cat-wise object whenever you have this corner. Yeah? Any, any, any geometry that has this property that that can be a snake here, basically, right? And that means that by just producing a tile set with such crazy even geometry, you can style the entire building or actually any given configuration in that building. Right? That's a gold mine. So you can practically mass produce a bunch of tiles on clay with which you can you can make any sort of a shape you know yeah. on the plane similarly in 3d you mass produce a bunch of tiles like as, as few as 16 or something that's amazing because then you can have a perfectly perfect architecture you take all the benefits of mass production at scale which is the economy of the scale which makes the production cheaper and yet you have the possibility to freely mass customize the outcome and keep it affordable. Big deal. Right? But but consider that these 16 are just the bare minimum. You are practically with the 16, you're presenting, you're creating a surface around the building, right? So to make it architectural, this is this will be the added value. To make it architectural, you need to differentiate between them, right? You need to differentiate. Yeah. Like because the perfect example of facing south and yeah, maybe for the ones facing south, you need a balcony. Yeah, that or, can also be integrated. exactly. Or even, for example, uh, this simple one, not even considering all the symmetry, this one can be a wall, or can be a wall with a window, or can be a wall with a smaller window. Or can be a wall with a different facade, and so on and so forth. Or can be an internal wall or an external mm -hmm. wall. So these are the architectural aspects that are that, being added. But in terms of sophistication and its yeah. efficiency, the if this then that situation yeah. you know, can can be sophisticated as well, the sophistication here is a positive thing, you know. That means that you have different plans for different things that you want to happen. Yeah. Or you, you can one would expect that there has to be such a degree of sophistication because if, if the the window is facing west in this climate or in Netherlands, it's desirable to have a balcony, right? Then we keep the idea of this selection of that situations or those situations can be a lookup table. So for the same reason that we can bring from this lookup table a part of a mesh, we can bring a a surface mesh or a, a polyhedral mesh or whatever other object that we want to bring here. It's just about the question of which one of these tiles, whatever they may be, yeah. right? So again, we reduce a problem of designing a shape to a decision-making problem. And that mm -hmm. is, I think, where we close the circle, yeah. right? So even the question of shape, which is a geometric question, we converted that to a question of decision making. Can I can I just ensure that the connection between if this then, uh, if this then that, uh, with the tiles and with the configuration is clear to everyone? Can you tell me what is the condition? Because we keep talking about the condition. Can you tell me what the con like? How do we represent this computation? Uh, it will be a Boolean, the outcome of it, that is true. But when we are checking, what exactly are we checking here? Can you tell me? Well, you can represent it that way, but it's really hard to compute it that way. So what what is this thing now? How do we represent this thing? We have a lattice for it, right? So how do we how can we check if this a particular situation. Yeah. How can we check a particular situation? 
Sorry. Yeah. In order to detect a label, right? Exactly. And how can we detect that label? That's, that's The lookup table is going to be something that will relate these indices to yeah. or labels. But how can we find the indices? I'm sorry, I'm going to the, the more sophisticated version of labels, right? The answer here is the stencil. This is an stencil on its own, right? The stencil checks this condition for us. Yes, because with the stencil, we can look at this particular thing. And, and see what's special. Compare it to something else, see if it matches or not. And if it does match it, based on the ID, we can retrieve the type. And you heard, you heard another name from Sayon this morning about this kind of stencil. A window, right? So you want to detect a particular situation, you want to look around a little bit, right? Maybe the answer. It's not something that you can see inside this magnifier. Maybe you need to look a little bit bigger, yeah. right? So in general, it's a window or it's a stencil on that lattice that you know you need to look into. A more technical term for it is kernel as well. Yeah, all of these exact kind of kernel. I'm curious, uh, if this is the same for In the other virtual kernel, this is dealing with the uh -huh. So, the kernel as in the kernel script in machine learning? Uh, I don't know. I know that part. It will be totally off. Okay. There is a connection, but that goes beyond the, the scope here. Yeah. But yeah, there, there is a so called kernel script in machine learning that. Uh, also, a signal processing. It, signal processing yeah, yeah. It, it is definitely related. Yeah, but that's a continuous kernel that they're talking about. That I wouldn't say just going back to it. This is a but even the discrete version is kind of kind of really. Yeah. They have the discrete version. Yeah, I, I have actually worked on some some kernels so that this goes beyond the scope. Because I only know this topic through the computer. Actually, topic. that notion of convolution that they're mentioning there is. The, uh, the analogous of convolution in the continuous space and the discrete space, which can be generalized even to non non regular space, irregular spaces such as let's say the real graph. So you can do convolution on graph as well. But in all of these cases, you are actually um, revisiting the idea of convolution in the discrete space, which makes that convoluted subject of convolution much easier to deal with. Yeah. Okay. So, shall I tell them that uh, in the workshop, I'm going to give you all of the things that we talked about today. I'm going to give you how you can start from a configuration, how you can check these conditions, how you can generate the tile set, the description of the tile set, that lookup table that you said. Yes, you need to have the empty version of it. So you know what you need to design for. You need to generate that. And then you bring that to a software and design every single one of them, every single one of these tiles. And then I'm going to also give you another piece of software that helps you to bring it back and assemble them. That right. magical part. Yeah. That goes on each one of these, reads the situation, and puts the tile there for you. There will be a moment of <laughs> deliverance from all the suffering of drawing things. Uh, at, at which point you will see that, you know, just automatically, that once you have set up all the rules and policies as to how you want to make borders to change in and out, etc., you magically get to set up as a, as a reward. Yeah. Right? Yeah without drawing a single line. I mean, you have drawn some lines, but you draw them only once yeah. forever. Yeah. And every time you draw them, you're creating a new tile set, which leaves yeah. a huge amount of space for all kinds of human creativity. Yeah. Yeah. So it's far from making a gigantic machine that does everything. It, it provides a lot of room for human creativity of course. in and the design of these uh, tile sets. And architectural intuition, because I think it's a bit beyond just designing these tile sets. It's even more into the direction. 
Because if it's a tile set, you can ask someone to design the tile set for you without letting them know. It's a bit more into the thinking of how you, into can, the sophistication yeah, how you can define these conditions, what you need to check for to place a window, what you need to check for to differentiate between an internal wall and external wall, what you need to check for to be able to differentiate, for example, the ceiling from the floor and so on and so forth. And that is the part that it gets super interesting for myself. Question. So when you were asking about the what is this part, um, you didn't give an answer because you were going to explain the next word called. No, the, the this I said it's essential. Oh, yeah. So designing that condition means that computationally you need to specify different kinds of stencils that checks different things. And these things can be a particular combination of yeah. the attributes of those boxes. Yeah. Right? So that will be a pattern that you want to detect in the stencils as to which you will decide on a label number using which you can retrieve the right size from the lookup table. Yeah. By putting those types together, you have made your okay. components. Can I make a couple of examples for them so it's more clear? One thing that you can do, for example, is that the stencil can check whether this side is outside and this side is inside. And that would be an external wall, right? Also, the stencil, as it's checking that, it also can check what is the potential, the daylight potential of these voxels and decide whether we need a window there or not. Or a balcony. Or a balcony, even. What else we can check here is that if these voxels have space red, this one has space blue, and whether this space blue is a wet space or a dry space, and whether we need to separate how do we need, what kind of internal wall do we need here. Is it okay if you have system on two sides? Is, do we need to tile it on the other side? Yes, can I ask a question? Because we're going to talk about two things, this or that. So would we need to have this idea? Do we need to boil it down to just this and this, or do we make multiple this and this? I, I think you make a less or a Yeah, may maybe sharing this in two pieces based upon another dimension of this, so maybe your question is very tempting. So for the sake of completeness, let me want to say something. So you said this will be the, the step uh, in the direction of going from the configuration space to the shape space, right? And this way we have discretized the question of shape also, right? So what can happen here is that suppose this is a configuration of these bubbly spaces. Let's hope that they're a little more reasonable. <laughs> it's not so bloody. Right? And let's use our magnifier, I don't know, let's say here. So with the magnifier, what we see is that there can be a border like this one for one block, another border for another block, and a border between in and out. So this one can be red block, this one can be the blue block, and this is the outside block. Right? So let's say this is red, this is blue, purple, and, and green. Right? So the same kind of question can be answered for each of these separately. In this chamber or out of this chamber, in this chamber or out of this chamber. And here we can, if we want to take this seriously, we can also see such a picture. So not only for the facade between the in and out, we can also have the interior facade, how do we even call it? Where components with which we can yeah. even partition the room in, in our configuration. Right. But in every case, there are uh, in and out. Not in every no, case. No, in, in well, here, yeah, you, see, every, you see here something else. Yeah. So there's P, R, and D. You see colors. So with respect to each of these colors, you can have a level set, right? All, give me all the cells whose color is red and everything else will be out, right? So this will give you the red 
colors. Let's say the red is the, the red faces, right? Yes. The facade of the red, red faces, all of them. You don't need to specify between all three combinations of spaces because different rooms, most of them, they don't need different walls. But there are some type of the rooms that they may need a different wall. In those cases, you need to be painted. Yes. Make sense? <laughs> The, the, the essentials are are here. Yeah. Yeah. It's come a long way from that of the next two generations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's why we decided to to change the workshop and, and yeah. first have this proper lecture about this, yeah. and then dive deep into the code because then, as as Sherman was explaining, you will notice. I hope you notice that. All the kind of sophistications we can do here will show how knowledgeable we are about what we're doing and how systematic we can be about what we're doing with the with the shaping of the building as a whole, right? So if, if we can make good decisions, this this is a way to show that we can systematically make good, these good decisions. You know, it's not just based on you know. So if if you have a rule in your mind, this would be the moment to formalize those rules and form this sophisticated system of decision making because what what's the reward at the end the reward is that there won't be any drawing in any depressive environment for for many hours with the heavy metal music yeah. yeah plus right you get the, the thing out magically that that's the reward right okay okay Shall so we have a yeah let's call it a day of lectures yeah Shall we have uh, a break and then start a round of yeah. consultations? Any burning question? Nope. Not the power of code because each one of the. Yes, I'm sorry, Yachek, I'm seeing your comments so late, but you are right, actually. It's about the question of how many cases the square can have due to mm -hmm. the power of four. Okay. 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 So I'm gonna say put a stop to the recording and uh, end the session. Thank you so much for being.